In 2016, Guillermo del Toro wrote an introduction that began with, When I was a child, a very young child, a hairline fracture became evident in my soul. I felt growingly disenfranchised, puzzled, and at odds with the adult world. It was made up of rules and notions that were both alien and unexplained, and life came to feel like a rigged game. It was almost entirely composed of lies. Adults lied to themselves and to others, and they endorsed their concerns and inventions, the ones they all agree to, money, power, war, repression, as real. But fantasy is frowned upon as childish. For some of us, it is not. Welcome to House of Words, a podcast about writers, inspiration, and monsters. I'm your host, Jason Nemoa Hardin, and on this episode, our 70th, and with it being the Halloween season, we decided to tackle one of the most creative and arguably one of the most original voices in the realm of fantasy, sci-fi, and of course, horror. Step right on in, get comfortable, and join us as we take a glimpse into the childhood, the inspirations, and the influences of the great Guillermo del Toro. I love monsters. If I go to a church, I'm more interested in the gargoyles than the saints. I really don't care much about the idea of normal. That's very uh, abstract to me. I think that perfection is practically unattainable, but imperfection is right at hand. So that's why I love monsters, because they represent a side of us we should actually embrace and celebrate." End quote. Guillermo del Toro Gomez was born on October 9, 1964, in Guadalajara, Mexico. Now, being Mexico's second most populous city, it provided del Toro with contextual and circumstantial experiences that fed into his imagination and fascination with horror and fantasy. In an interview with Jason Wood, Yermo talks about images of brutality and violence that impacted him, including the sight of mutilated corpses in a car crash, which he witnessed at the tender age of four. Also fueling his fascination was the gory religious imagery imposed upon him through Mexico's Catholic tradition. This was not only in the iconography and rituals of the church, but also, and maybe even more so, in his grandmother's alarmingly graphic accounts of the perils of purgatory and hell. In fact, he lived with his grandmother for many years, during which time she exorcised him, twice, adding to his fear. All of this led to him spending a significant amount of his childhood worrying about the horrors that could come in the afterlife. Yermo later stated that he suffered from the guilt of Catholic mythology and was therefore a tortured soul in his formative years. Although this guilt was mostly fueled by his grandmother's oppressive deity, her influence would be affectionately acknowledged in the dedication of his first full feature, Kronos, to her memory. Despite the jokiness with which he describes his religious upbringing, this concern with purgatorial states would become a key element in his films as numerous of his characters seem to exist in a limbo-like interstitial state of being that blurs the borders between life and death, light and darkness, redemption and loss, being and nothingness. His fondness for locating his narratives in spaces haunted by seen or unseen monsters is prefigured in this early immersion in the language, ritual, and imagery of judgment and potential damnation. Now, being quite self-driven since he was young, he learned English by reading Mad Magazine and Famous Monsters with a dictionary at his side. His method was quite effective given that he became fluent in English by age seven. And once he acquired this second language in his repertoire, he never stopped reading. Later in life, he would actually comment on his omnivorous reading habit and how he felt himself insatiable when it came to the world of the written word. 
But while still a young boy, his father won a six million dollar lottery. And Pops would use this newfound fortune to build an empire of car dealerships, but perhaps more important for young Yermo, his father spent a large chunk of the money on an extensive library. I read it all, he would later say. There was an encyclopedia about human health, one about literature, one about fine arts. So I learned about Duga, Monet, Manet at the same time I was learning about Stan Lee. I read everything I could until puberty hit. Then my interest changed a little, and I read a little less. He was eight years old when he began to borrow his father's Super 8 camera. And just as he had taught himself English, he taught himself how to use a camera by doing, only hindered by the expensive cost of the film. And one of his first movies involved having action toys killing each other. He would fill a plastic figure with ketchup, go up to the roof of the house, throw it off, and watch it explode. Now his earliest ambition was to be a marine biologist, live by the sea, and study creatures of the deep while writing horror stories about them. Now this ambition was curtailed, however, at the discovery of a thing known as directing. That's right, a director. Marine biology pushed aside. The world was now blessed with the birth of Del Toro, the director. Now, another fascination, one he would explore more deeply in his first American-made full-feature film, were bugs. Teachers from his hometown recalled young Yermo arriving to class with giant cockroaches. <sighs> cockroaches. Well, if that doesn't get you, he went even further, staging competitions with the other kids to see who could find Guadalajara's biggest cockroach. He would show up to class boasting, I've got one that's seven centimeters. Childhood friends even recall helping him shoot an eight millimeter short movie at their school, which featured a gelatinous monster. Well, television also played a large role in his development as he would watch repeats of shows that dealt in science fiction and fantasy horror, such as The Outer Limits and Rod Serling's The Night Gallery. Now, this not only gave the already hyper-imaginative young man ghoulish nightmares, but also helped deepen his fascination and knowledge with the horror genre. From reading and watching horror and fantasy, and already having begun to experiment with short films, came the next natural step in his evolution, writing. Now, as a young reader, he recalled being fascinated by two authors in particular, in English, the precise manner in which novelist Ray Bradbury used adjectives, and in Spanish, the musical language of screenwriter Juan Rulfo. His voracious appetite for reading evolved into a love of writing, first his own short horror stories, then writing scripts for radio plays that he would record on cassette. Del Toro seems to have had a sophisticated taste in film as a child. For instance, in his commentary on the Criterion list, he talks of having seen the two classic Kaneto Shindo shockers, Onibaba from 1964 and Kuroneko from 1968 when he was just 10 years old. He would joke that the movies did some serious damage to his psyche. He describes Shindo's films as a perverse, sweaty double bill. Their melding of Japanese folklore with a modern sensibility rooted in violence and the destructive the movies explored a dynamic that would re-emerge in his films, particularly in The Devil's Backbone and Pan's Labyrinth. Rather more conventionally, in contrast to Shindo's films, perhaps, Disney films such as Fantasia and Sleeping Beauty also provided an early exposure to the power of the fairy tale narrative, as well as the obsessive and perverse appeal of monsters. Now, Chernobog, the black demon who appears in the night on the bald mountain sequence of Fantasia, is pointed out by Yermo as one of his favorite film creatures, along with the dragon that the evil Maleficent from Sleeping Beauty morphs into at the end of the film. He also has a list of actors who made an impact on him, his first favorite of which were the undisputed stars of classic horror from the early to mid-twentieth century, Lon Chaney. Boris Karloff, Vincent Price, and Peter Cushing. 
This fascination with these icons of classic horror later translated into his assimilation of stylistic and thematic features from the universal classics of James Whale and Todd Browning, as well as the Edgar Allan Poe adaptations of Roger Corman and the Hammer-produced films of Terence Fisher. Now, his boldly symbolic use of color and light in particular seems to be heavily influenced by the latter two directors. It was further enhanced by his love for the Italian Yallo horror movies of the 1960s and 70s, specifically the work of director Mario Bava, especially his movies Black Sunday and Black Sabbath. Dario Argento was yet another one, in particular his movies Deep Red and Suspiria. The latter film clearly displayed Argento's increased prioritizing of often extreme images at the expense of plot. This was surely an influence on Del Toro's own aesthetic given his stated preference for the visual over the verbal. Now, another talent he was blessed with was the ability to draw, which he began at an early age. When drawing his monster stories, he would draw the illustrations first and basically never write the story. He would find himself drawing 20 illustrations for a novel and then maybe write half a chapter, but there was the occasional full chapter when, and only when, he forced himself. With the images there and complete, he just wasn't driven to tell the story anymore. He was simply too happy with the images by themselves. Being wary of excessive dialogue-driven narratives, he has said that his ideal movie would have no dialogue. It would just be a camera implicating the viewer in the action. As a teenager, he continued to play around with Super 8 and on top of that put in as much time as he could in projection rooms of local cinema clubs, which was apparently a common activity where he's from. Around this same time, roughly 14 years old, he saw a film that changed his life, artistically that is. That movie was Los Olvidados, The Young and the Damned, directed by Luis Buñuel, in English, mind you. And for our cinephiles out there, it was shot on 16mm film. Now, after Yermo introduced the film, he and his cinema club buddies watched it and discussed it afterwards. He held the title of projectionist in the club, so he would spool the film, and all in all, he would see an average of four films over a weekend. He has expressed particular admiration for the way Buñuel allowed character to emerge through action rather than dialogue, saying, People now expect screenplays to explain the characters, not to show them. But it's a paradigm I think of what is a great screenplay, which is, you let the character be defined by his actions. Quote, If you are true to yourself, if you only do things you really believe in that are personal to you, then you don't need the approval of anyone else. That's what, in my opinion, distinguished the great horror filmmakers and the great filmmakers in general. Don't try to become someone else. I have never made a movie that I wouldn't die for. End quote. And then... There is the master of suspense, Alfred Hitchcock, who has also had a profound impact on Yermo. In his early 20s, he published a full-length study of Hitchcock. In a 2008 prologue, he described it as a time capsule in which a young man tries to articulate what Hitchcock means for him in particular. This book is the prayer of a filmmaker raised to the most unreachable Olympus in search of inspiration. Several years later, in 2012, he held public masterclasses at the 2012 Toronto Film Festival covering four of Hitchcock's films. That same year, he published a short article in Sight and Sound which focused specifically on the influence that Hitchcock's films have had on his own work. His opening remarks in the article acknowledge his debt to Hitchcock, explaining how Hitchcock's films are the ones he revisits more than those of any other filmmaker except perhaps Buñuel. He does affirm, however, that he doesn't attempt any imitation of Hitchcock, 
either thematically or visually, suggesting that the only things he shares with his great predecessor are issues of Catholic guilt. Well, he has occasionally borrowed some trademark visual effects, such as the keyhole shot which appears at a particularly frightening moment in The Devil's Backbone, where the ghostly Santi peers through the keyhole at Carlos. In the commentary track of the movie, he explains, In order to get our shot, we made an oversized keyhole. I used to call it the Hitchcock keyhole because it was like one of the oversized props that Hitchcock used to get depth of field in films such as Dial M for murder or the glass of milk that Ingrid Bergman drinks in Notorious. It is certainly a Hitchcockian, Bunyelian moment, and I dreamt for so long about this sequence, and I wanted so much for it to be successful. And when I finally made it, I was filled with a childish sense of glee being a little closer to my bastion of heroes. Hitchcock's manipulation and interrogation of conventional notions of innocence and guilt also provided the filmmaker with a context for his own meditations on innocence, particularly in relation to childhood. Like Hitchcock, he wants to disturb the innocent, but unlike Hitchcock, he repeatedly explores the figure of the child in a hostile world. Now, having been a lonely child himself, he often makes his child protagonist reflective and somewhat lonely. Similarly, Hitchcock's focus on social reality as a starting point for an exploration of the darkness within the human in films such as Shadow of a Doubt and Psycho is replayed by Del Toro on a broader and more explicit historical and cultural scale, whether it be Mexico-U.S. relations in the 1990s or the legacy of the Spanish Civil War. At age 28, Guillermo del Toro made his first full-feature movie, the independently Mexican-made Kronos. Kronos became enough of a major success to attract Hollywood interest, which led to his next film, Mimic, being American-made. As it has happened so many times, with success came unfortunate repercussions. Around 1997, Guillermo's father, Federico del Toro Torres, was kidnapped in Guadalajara. The kidnappers demanded a ransom if the family wanted him back in one piece. Immediately after learning of the kidnapping, fellow filmmaker James Cameron, a friend since they met after the production of Kronos, offered to help pay for the negotiator. Del Toro accepted the help. And regarding the incident, he would say, it was a really, really harrowing situation. And he came in and he took charge. He said, the hostage negotiator will be in your house in 72 hours to help you go through the process. He did it on his own, and we didn't ask. He volunteered, and he did offer, he said, I'll pay for the ransom. He did offer. He is that kind of guy. He is incredibly loyal, incredibly strong. In the end, the family paid twice the initial ransom. Fortunately, his father was released, having spent 72 days kidnapped. Now, the culprits were never apprehended, and the money was never recovered. Yermo would eventually repay Cameron. This event prompted he, his parents, and his siblings to move abroad. In an interview in 2008 with Time magazine, he said this about the kidnapping. Every day, every week, something reminds me that I am in involuntary exile. By his count, he has written or co-written around 33 screenplay features. Two or three of those have been made by others. Eleven have been made by him, which means that about 20 screenplays have never moved on to become movies. Now, to further stress the dedication and perseverance, each script takes roughly six to ten months of work. So doing the math, that is roughly 16 years writing scripts. What is it that keeps him going? Well. It's the experience of creating something and the fact that it allows him to improve his skills. Here's an overview of his process. He begins by writing an outline, usually between 70 and 90 pages. He then hands that over to his co-writer and says, do whatever you want. His reasoning behind this is that if he doesn't give them this amount of freedom, he'll never know how they really feel or what story they truly want to tell. Then the work in progress makes its way back to him, 
and from there he either loves it or he hates it. He reasons that there is little lost during this process as you can always undo the changes later. From Kronos to Mimic, to Pan's Labyrinth, to The Shape of Water, Yermo del Toro has proven that hard work, some luck, and lots of preparation is what makes childhood dreams come true. As usual, let's wrap this episode with a quote from the friend of the monsters. The note I resonate with is low, dark, and full of monsters. Seeing one of my favorite creatures, I turn into Bernini St. Teresa or Stendhal contemplating Yoto. I was lost when they found me, the monsters. Lost like Mowgli in the jungle, like Romulus and Remus in the Tiber, and these beings gazed upon me with kindness. They too were outcasts of this absurd world that demanded impossible perfection and gave nothing back. They were the antipodes of perfection, defined by their condition, disposition, and appearance, and wanting simply to exist. End quote. Thank you for listening. I hope you've enjoyed this episode and will spread the word about the podcast. Once again, I have been your host, Jason and Moore Harden. We here at House of Words ask that you please consider helping to make this show easier to produce and more frequent by contributing on our Patreon page at patreon.com slash house of words or paypal.me slash house of words podcast. Alternatively, you can subscribe and encourage others to subscribe to our YouTube page, House of Words Podcast. Every little bit helps more than you might think. Until next time, happy Halloween and keep turning those pages. House of Words is written and produced by Crystal M. Sanchez. Narrated and written by me, Jason and Moore Harden. And music by Creature Nine and Wood. All rights and ownership belong to Crystal M. Sanchez and Jason Nemo Harding.